Hi, and uh, good morning. I'm not a native English speaker, obviously. I know my accent is strange. We're leaving. It's evolving, okay? So please turn on the subtitles so our videos can make more sense. Now, if you're anything like me, you're not a fan of suspense. If you want to know exactly what we think of pantheism in five words or less, jump to this timestamp and you should have your answer. The rest of this video is about why we think so. Shall we begin? Namaskar Adab and Dikta. I'm Aditya and you're watching The Indian Atheist. This video is a brief response to a recent comment by one of our audience who goes by Internet Girl. I chose this comment to respond to first among a host of other comments by other people that I've been meaning to respond to because this one serves as a nice segue into our definition of atheism. Internet Girl writes, I believe out of genuine curiosity, quote, isn't pantheism good? Isn't the fact that someone considers God to be so useless good? Isn't the fact that they use God simply as a metaphor to show gratitude and respect towards nature good? Or is it not? Most pantheists I'm aware of don't think of God in any form. It is merely a metaphor and even Richard Dawkins agrees that it is a metaphor in his book God Delusion while talking about Albert Einstein's usage of the word God. Dr. Dawkins, she writes, firmly sticks to only criticizing personal God and urges people who use God as a metaphor to use it less often as people might mistake it for a personal God. Unquote. Thank you, Internet Girl, for giving us a template to organize our criticism of pantheism around. This is indeed a very good question and I'm sure it resonates with a lot of pantheists and panentheists and spiritual types. For all practical purposes, they're all one and the same. Even more urgently, as it stands, the position perfectly describes the highly customizable brand of Hinduism recently adopted by a large number of well-educated and affluent Indians. But here in this video, we'll treat this as a personal query and not assume that it speaks for all pantheists or Hindus or other spiritual folks. They're free to write their own comments or not. Fair enough? Okay, let's start with the crux of the argument here, which is that pantheists use God simply as a metaphor to show gratitude and respect to nature. This is apparently different from the rest of the believers who either A, don't show gratitude and respect to nature or B, show gratitude and respect to nature through God or C, show gratitude and respect to nature and also quite apart from that, believe in God. Let's get that out of the way. But hold on, can we? Isn't the theist or the deist God omnipresent? So he must be present in nature too in some form. So the theist worships God and believes that God is nature among other things whereas the pantheist worships nature and believes that nature is God among other things. Wait, what? It's confusing. Isn't the theist just twisting words around so he can sound smarter than the theist? Like, I'm not a dumb fucking theist because I use metaphors, bitch. Look, in all seriousness, I get it. I get the sentiment. I believe me, been there, done that. Who isn't a pantheist at 16, right? On the face of it, it's a very grand sentiment at once humbling and ennobling. It's the monster of a casual indifference hiding behind the sentiment, oftentimes unbeknownst even to the holder of the sentiment that I want to kick in its teeth. The idea of God as a metaphor for gratitude and respect towards nature is problematic on a number of levels. First, respect for nature. In the sense of reference, there's no real reason to respect nature. Why should I respect the Andromeda galaxy or Jupiter or a random asteroid? Why should I revere a mountain? The mountain doesn't revere me, but I should. Why? Because it's big? What am I in Stone Age? Why should I revere nature? How should I revere nature? What does that even mean for an invasive species like ours that's almost always wholly destructive and disruptive to any ecosystem it comes in contact with? Also, does nature have agency to punish me if I don't revere it or, or reward me if I do? No. 
then why bother? What is to be gained from an attitude of reference towards nature? Note that the reasons for environmental conservation don't actually stem from reference or respect of any kind, although we'd like to think so. The only incentive for our conservation efforts that makes any sense is good old self-preservation. Reference for nature may be correlated with being environmentally conscious, although I highly doubt that, but either way, correlation doesn't mean causation. Your reference for nature doesn't mean shit, because the fact is, we treat nature like shit all day long. Besides, nature itself is very loosely defined in all such pronouncements of reference. Should I also respect the fresh piece of turd I deposited into the toilet this morning? That's nature too. Should I refuse the stray strands of pubic hair caught in a public urinal's drain strainer? Should I respect cockroaches, or maggots, or rotten eggs, or stale cheese, or a psoriasis patch, or gangrene? I'm perfectly aware that I'm cherry-picking counterexamples, but that's the whole point. You disrespect one, you disrespect all. In the sense of awe and wonder though, there's every reason to respect nature. It's vast and immense and awesome beyond human comprehension or imagination. At a microscopic level, even turds and cockroaches and gangrene have entire fascinating worlds nestled within them. Nature amazes the human senses at any scale. It invites awe in its details, it invites wonder in its diversity, it invites respect, but it's not the self-serving kind of respect that's reserved for deities or dictators. Remember, this is not respect out of reference, this is respect out of sheer awe and wonder. This is respect of the kind that's not transferable to empty metaverse and placeholders. And the universe elicits profound respect of this kind in any sane person. You don't have to be a pantheist or a theist or a deist or even spiritual to feel it. You just have to be alive. Are we really so blindsided by religion that we can't respect nature without putting it in a container called God? That is, I don't understand the motivation for that. And by the way, FYI, we use 80 to 130 litres of water every day, which is a whopping 3000% or so of the daily amount we need to survive. We indiscriminately burn fossil fuels to go from point A to point B, to light up our houses and to power our way of life. Our solid waste is filling up mountains of plastic trash in some stinky part of the suburb as we speak and you, the audience, you probably think it fit to bring more of us into this world or you already have. So don't, please, let's not even talk about respect or reverence for nature, okay? That covers the first objection. Second, metaphor. <laughs> Our newfound obsession with this notion of metaphor and allegory is, is juvenile to say the least. I mean, everything is a metaphor these days. Myths and legends are metaphors. Heroes and villains are metaphors. Rituals and traditional festivals are metaphors. Foods and fairy tales are metaphors, you're a metaphor, I'm a metaphor, and of course, gods are metaphors. Now, I'm no expert, but I believe that it's probably true that the metaphors we use in everyday lives can help us understand how human beings create new meanings by relating to our more abstract concepts and then building on those relations to make sense of other abstract concepts. That's what the Greek philosopher Aristotle thought anyway, and that's fine, I mean, obviously, there has to be a lot more to the process of creation of knowledge, but you know what, I'll take it. I like metaphors, they're great as a figure of speech and also as possible tools to learning, acquiring and storing new information. But beyond that, what's so special about this concept that people take it without much analysis as some kind of a profound insight into truth? The sheer adulation that this infantile notion receives from Jung to Peterson, from psychology to semiotics, it just baffles me. And more importantly, pantheists seem to forget that although a metaphor relates to seemingly unrelated things, it still needs at least one commonality between the two to make it work, in the absence of which it becomes an equation, not a relation. Take for example the metaphor, life is a stage. Life indeed, in an abstract sense, has a lot in common with the theatrical stage. What does God have in common with the universe? Nothing other than the qualities that the believer himself ascribes to God. That is equating God to the universe, that's not a metaphor. It becomes a metaphor, albeit a trivial one, only after you've equated God to the universe, as in the universe is God, 
because we've defined God to be equal to the universe. Make sense? Don't worry if it doesn't. In fact, it's not supposed to make sense because it's fucking circular. It either comes down to saying that the universe is the universe or God is God. It's just a change of name. God as a metaphor for the universe. How does it help our understanding? How does it help the human condition? How does it change anything other than inflating a pantheist's ego by enabling him to position himself as someone who's smarter than a theist? You change the name of the universe to God and you think you're being very smart? On the contrary, God as a metaphor for everything. Why does everything need a metaphor? It is literally everything. Just call it everything. Calling it God doesn't change a single thing for the better. Mathematically, you have what's called a redundant equation. That's one too many equations for the number of unknowns you have. And redundant equations still contain a statement of some significance to the problem. This one, on the other hand, is not even that. It's more like a 2 is equal to 2 kind of a thing. That's not really an equation even. That's there's absolutely nothing of value to be found in there. And not only are metaphors quite useless in this regard, but they're also dangerous. They're dangerous because when used in this haphazard capacity, they constitute a slippery slope. One can literally interpret anything as a metaphor for something else. Such interpretations try to relate completely unrelated things without any of that much needed commonality or a causal connection and stretch too thin as they often are, they break under the slightest bit of probing. People think they are coming up with great and original and innovative ideas, but that's not innovation. That way lies madness. Try reading one of Jordan Peterson's books to see just how far you can stretch the idea of myths and metaphors and allegories and archetypes. There's no precision in thought, no clarity, no falsifiability, no takeaway, very little analysis, very vague evidence and just loads and loads of fancy words that only betray his incredulity at his own ideas. Pretty much from the 10th page onwards, you literally lose all sense of reality as in nothing makes sense anymore, nothing connects to anything else and yet, if you show extraordinary perseverance to trudge along till the end of the book, you come out with like a gazillion loose ends that you have no idea what to do with. The end always leaves you with a distinct sense of fake closure, sort of like the last season of Game of Thrones, as if the author had no clear end in sight to begin with, no roadmap of any kind for his ideas despite boasting tall titles like maps of meaning and is now desperately struggling to force a convergence of his ideas into a grand conclusion. This is precisely why Peterson has to very often save face and consciously distance himself from the incels and the white supremacists and the men's rights activists because those loose ends send notoriously mixed signals by design attracting a wide variety of confused and intellectually vulnerable people. In India, one can find very similar elements in the works of Ms. Golwalkar and V.D. Savarkar and P.G. Tilak and a slew of other spiritual types like J. Krishnamurti and Osho Rajneesh and even Swami Vivekanand. <gasps> Blasphemy! Yeah, whatever. There's no Islamic scholar in this list because they don't do this metaphor shit. They're not known for sending mixed signals. They send very unambiguous clear-cut signals, but at least one knows exactly where they stand. That was the second objection. Third, gratitude. Gratitude for what exactly? Life, I assume? Life is hard. It's a tormenting struggle to postpone death. We usually don't recognize it as such because we are special. We are the apex predators on this planet. Not all species are quite as fortunate. With the current rate of deforestation in North India, for example, I don't think a Bengal tiger has a lot to be grateful for in the 21st century. Should the recently extinct dodos also have been grateful? Okay, forget about all of life. Even within our own species, things are not so rosy but for a few select groups. What did the South Africans or the Native Americans or the indigenous Australians or the Haitians or any other peoples under the heel of their colonization or European masters have to be grateful for? What did the Dalits and the lower caste people of India have to be grateful for? What about the victims of the Holocaust or the tens of thousands of innocent people massacred during the partition of India or the Rwandan genocide? What about the Rohingya Muslims of Myanmar or the Syrian refugees or the thousands of farmers in India who are lost every year to this little-known phenomenon called farmer suicides? 
they drink a bottle of pesticide to kill themselves, what should they be grateful for? If your answer is a life reduced to mere survival, even you'll admit that it's a really low bar for gratitude. This whole idea of gratitude for life, for abundance of resources, for the opportunities that one receives, is intricately tied to the privileges that we, the luckier of the Lord, enjoy. I personally do have a lot to be thankful for. I am an upper caste and upper middle class Hindu male in a Hindu majority country. Plus, you see this? This is a fair skin for an Indian, something we seem to value a lot. I wonder why. So, upper caste, Hindu, fair, male and not born poor either. That's a pretty solid foundation right there for being an all-round, well-adjusted, successful individual in India. It's as if I'm bound to succeed. All I have to do is just go with the flow. Someone with my privileges has to actively try hard and fuck things up real bad to fail at life. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole subset of privileges that come with an upper caste identity. There's another set that's that's linked to fair skin and another one that's exclusive to Hindus in India and of course, the whole shebang that comes with a dick. Now tell me, should I be grateful for my life as an upper caste Hindu fair male? That's rhetorical. I'm not grateful, I will not be grateful. I acknowledge that I am privileged but to express gratitude for my privileges is to be tacitly thankful for the fact that other people do not have those privileges. Come to think about it, Anything you're grateful to God for is possibly something someone else doesn't have. It's possibly something you know you may just as well not have had and it's probably something you only have at the expense of someone else not having it. Why else would you be grateful? You're grateful for having a fair skin. You're not grateful for having a skin. Everyone has one. In this sense, being grateful to the Almighty for all the nice things you enjoy is actually a deplorable character trait in adults. I don't know how else to see it. I guess the pantheists also acknowledge the privileges of the lives they are born into, same as I do. The difference is, because I don't have a stick up my ass, I don't particularly feel the need to be grateful about any of it. I am instead deeply disturbed by it, by the fact that I have this special status and all these opportunities and things that so many others have never had and may never have. This, more than anything else, is wherein lies the heart of my atheism. It's called empathy. Meanwhile, pantheists need to come up with a better argument than one that involves nature or respect or gratitude or metaphors. They're not the first ones to use these lame arguments and they won't be the last. But for fuck's sake, this is the 21st century. That's just getting old and fast. As for the rest of the query, we also have that most pantheists don't think of God as having any form. Well, how can they even think about something that doesn't have a form? They either have a different kind of a brain than a regular model human beings, or they're thinking about something that indeed has a form. Apply Occam's razor and voila, the ladder wins. Surprise, surprise, the bugger has a form. It's just that the form is not in any way at all distinct from the universe. <laughs> it's such a pathetically dishonest idea that I literally want to puke all over it and then shit on top of it and even that wouldn't mask the sheer obnoxiousness of that dishonesty. I hope you see the double standards there. Postulate an impersonal God without a form so you can lord it over the poor old ignorant theists and deists and when it comes time to submit your God for scrutiny, he's just the whole universe, the, the ground of my being, nothing more. This is hypocrisy at its most appalling. Of course, the, the Eastern pantheist will now rummage through his scriptures for some vague and unremarkable quote like the world is in you or the, the only way out is in. Yeah, no, a world is in you. The world is very much outside of you. Do you not have, I don't know, senses? Whichever way you look at it, however you choose to interpret it, the only way out is out, not in, what the fuck? Meanwhile, the Western pantheist will try to wriggle out of the hole he has dug for himself with equally mystical but slightly slicker and slimier arguments involving dialectical identity or moral relativism or some other fancy words that sound very academic. Don't fall for that trap. The fact remains that the pantheist god is even more unfalsifiable than the theist god and therefore the pantheist is an even bigger fool. As long as the claim remains unfalsifiable, the pantheist can go ahead and shove it up his highfalutin ass, where his head is currently at. As far as the impersonal nature of the pantheist god is concerned, let me ask you this. 
If the pantheist God is not personal, where are they getting all that shit about God from? And second of all, granted the pantheist may only have a one-way relationship with God, but he is after all going to all this trouble of sculpting his own bloody form of God out of nothing or everything, and he is bestowing on his God properties of his own choosing and that includes a God with the property of having no properties at all. How is that not anything but personal? Tell you the truth, I don't much care about this distinction between personal and impersonal God, given that only those with the luxury of being immune to the harm and charm of religions can afford to presume such a distinction in the first place. That includes me, for starters, but also Richard Dawkins and Albert Einstein. Now, while it's certainly true that God delusion clearly has its sights trained on theism and personal God, I don't think that Richard Dawkins is particularly lenient with the kind of pantheism that has infested the elite of the modern society. Do watch his conversation with Satish Kumar in the documentary Enemies of Reason. When he says pantheism is sexed up atheism, he is referring almost exclusively to the Einsteinian brand of pantheism. At any rate, I'm sure he's aware of the fact that most pantheists don't stop at the Einstein's or Hawking's notion of God. There's all sorts of add-ons and embellishments available in pantheism. You add some transcendence mumbo-jumbo and it becomes panentheism. You sprinkle some spiritual hocus-pocus and it becomes holism. You add some quantum mechanics and you get whatever the picture is. Barebone pantheism itself is richly adorned with all the trappings of religion. It's basically a skeleton of a religion waiting to be fleshed up. The fact that the likes of Einstein and Hawking get away with only the most gentle reprimand in God delusion doesn't mean that Dawkins will put up with all the bullshit that goes on under the name of pantheism or spirituality. Nor will any other atheist worth assault. If you're in doubt, please look up pantheism in any old encyclopedia and then look me in the eye and tell me that it looks even remotely like atheism. Are you kidding me? Now let's talk about India for a bit. We are after all the Indian atheist. Anyone who believes that pantheism or panentheism or spirituality are relatively harmless should definitely spend some time in India to see just how well pantheism ingratiates itself with the local traditional structures of organized religion and how crazy effective it is in leeching off of its host religion's powers. We are quite literally a country of pantheists and panentheists. To be clear, while it undermines reason every step of the way, the nature of pantheistic belief itself is not its biggest problem to me as an Indian. My main issue with pantheism is that it teaches a certain indifference towards the evils of mainstream religion. It promotes a culture of self-obsession and obscurantism that makes it really difficult to formally address religious depredations and exploitations head on. It encourages people to be more forgiving to the theistic doctrines, to interpret them in a way that's comfortable to you and your own conscience, no matter how terribly twisted the machinations of religion are. Now why would one type of religious faith be so generous with the other? Why would pantheism in India give a free pass to its competitor faith, Hinduism, and vice versa? They shouldn't and they wouldn't, unless the two were in cahoots. In particular, the brand of pantheism that's indigenous to India comes in two stripes. The first is the Hindu pantheism plaguing the common poor masses, which is essentially a thin and semi-transparent veneer on Hinduism that eminently fails at masking its orthodoxies and superstitions and dogmatic nature. And the second is the pantheistic Hinduism of the rich or the upwardly mobile middle-class Indians, which is nothing but a parasite living off of mainstream polytheistic Hinduism. Neither of the two can be characterized as benign. The difference is, while the former results from centuries of indoctrination and poor education and poor penetration of science in our society, the latter is the byproduct of the social and political apathy of the great Indian middle class. Taken together, the two constitute the majority of the second most populous country in the world chiefly made of people who are polytheists proper while inside the premises of a temple and pantheists pretty much everywhere and everyone else, but all the while, Hindus through and through. Add to this about 14% of strictly theist, starkly orthodox and chiefly Sunni Muslims, consisting of the world's third largest Muslim population and the largest outside of any Muslim majority country in the world, and you have 
a Mentos and a Coke bottle kind of a situation. So far, the only reason we haven't decimated each other seems to be that we are mostly poor and therefore, despite our religions, we have been and we remain a reasonable and an exceptionally peace-loving people because the poor can't afford the luxury of not being reasonable or peace-loving. In a way, therefore, our poverty has acted like an armor against communal tensions. Lately though, with the influx of money in the hands of the middle class and a populist government catering precisely to that demographic, there have been some chinks in that armor and uh, who knows what's going to happen next. Not very surprisingly, the millennials from the upper sections of the Indian society are not waiting around to find out. Most of them are singularly focused on getting an engineering or a medical degree so they can get the hell out of this place the first chance they get and finally lead that much sought after peaceful life in the UK or the US or Canada or Australia. The Rivendells to our Middle Earth were reside the noble elves of our species. Circling back to Einstein, I have great respect and admiration for Einstein the physicist and Einstein the pacifist. But frankly, I don't care whether the Einsteinian god is personal or public or under a joint fucking custody with his ex-wife. I'm after the god that terrorizes the poor into worshipping him and emptying his pockets in the process. The one that bullies the weak into submission, the one that picks on those without the means to fight back. The pantheist god or the god of the spiritual, the god of the mystics, the god of the successful, the god of the top 1% is at best a passive bystander in this fight and an enemy of reason and at worst just as big of an impediment to the emancipation of the oppressed and therefore just as big of a douche. So honestly, to hell with pantheism and to hell with his god too. That's where we stand. Now, dear pantheist, since you like metaphors so much, you can either get a metaphorical pair of balls and stand with us or have a nice vacation at Bora Bora with your useless and metaphorically spineless vegetable of a god for all I care. You do you, Mr. and Mrs. Pantheist. Just don't get your bourgeois ass in our way while we are working to right the wrongs of mainstream religion. It's annoying. Just because you're outside the radius of religious harm doesn't mean the rest of the world is. You and your unholy alliance with organized religions pose a logistical issue in terms of mobilizing our painfully limited resources. But don't flatter yourself into thinking that you're an intellectual threat to us. Not really. On that level, you're just a minor nuisance. Dispensing with your paltry arguments for the god of everything is like squatting a fly. I can do it anytime I want to, but I usually don't because I kind of like the distraction when it's just one or two of you. But come at me in swarms of ten or more and I swear to god I'll squat the shit out of you all and eat you for dinner too. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is called a metaphor. I'm not a vain person nor a violent one. I'm not squatting anything, it's just a figure of speech and a humble attempt to give the pantheist a taste of his own medicine. God doesn't matter for my ass. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Dhaniwa. Shukriya.